In this episode, we will talk about how to mimic human metabolism in mice. For example, neurons, glia. Let's talk pharmacokinetics for antibody development. Following the transplantation of hematopoietic cells. Let's talk how to test if your drug induces a cytokine storm. Welcome to JAX Tech Talk with the technical information scientists of the Jackson Laboratory. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Jack's Tech Talk with the technical information scientists of the Jackson Laboratory. My name is Janine Lomar Kelly, and my role as a technical information scientist is to serve the research community with education and practical solutions. Jack's Tech Talk is a 15 minute chat that may be of interest to anyone in preclinical research and drug development. Please use the Q&A pod over on the lower right-hand side of your screen to tell us where you're viewing from. And we'd love to hear about your thoughts, especially of any personal experiences on today's topic. I'll be monitoring that Q&A pod and then sharing your commentary with the group. So today, let's talk of mice and monkeys. Today, we're going to continue to explore a common theme of our show, which is appropriate model selection. What's unique today is that we are going to focus on the role of rodent versus non-human primate models in drug development pipeline, particularly of the antibody-based therapeutics such as monoclonal antibodies and bispecific antibodies. And those have become a major avenue in drug design in the last 10 years. My colleague, Dr. Adriano Flora, is joining us with his perspectives on antibody drug development. Ad Adriano, can you please introduce yourself? Sure, thank you very much, Janine. And um, I, uh, well, my name is Adriano Flora, as you just mentioned, and I got a PhD in pharmacology and toxicology a few years ago in Milano, Italy, before moving on at Baylor College of Medicine in Texas as a postdoc first and then assistant professor to study neurodevelopment and um, oncogenesis in the nervous system. About 10 years ago, I moved back to Europe and I left active research to work with different um, companies. Uh, especially in this period of time, I worked a lot with drug developers and antibody drug developers on the needs for models with a focus on mouse models. Great, thank you. And briefly, I have a PhD in postdoc training in oncology where I was in very early drug efficacy testing, but I'm not affiliated with any regulatory agencies or drug development pipeline myself. So Adriano, perhaps let's start by having you give us high level overview of, um, you know, since you're, you've been uh, working with antibody drug developers and other drug developers for many years, what's your perspective and high level overview of historically how rodents and non-human primates are used in drug development and what kind of requirements by the various regulatory agencies exist and what's that rationale? And we can start maybe with small molecules for comparison. Well, <laughs> that's a kind of a wide topic for a 15 minute talk, for a first question on a 15 minute talk, but just to give you a general overview of how the regulatory landscape was shaped um, in the, I would say, the previous millennium almost. Uh, all of the drugs, almost all of the drugs were small molecules. And by small molecules, I mean molecules that weigh just a few hundred kilodaltons. And small molecules have very, very specific characteristics. For example, since they are small, they interact with very, a uh, few point of contacts with the target proteins. And since these interactions are not very strong, um, they can interact not just with their specific target, but with other proteins that are not the specific targets. So the major worry of, of regulatory agencies um, for, known, for small molecules are essentially off target effects. Now that's the downside of small molecules. The upside of small molecules is that they generally cross-react between species. So you can test for these off-target effects or these toxic effects in non-human species. So rodents are a clear initial uh, testing, rats and mice, but also dogs, mini pigs, uh, before getting to monkeys. And um, the regulatory agencies focus on what is called a relevant species for drug testing. And in the case of small molecules, relevant species can really be 
varying species. So the general landscape calls for the general regulatory landscape calls for at least two species to be tested. Um, and we have a lot of experience in how to do that. Now, this might be completely different for large molecules, which are completely different molecules, as you know. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for large molecules, as you mentioned, you've been working with antibody developers for several years. Why is there a stronger interest in developing antibody-based therapeutics as compared to you know, historical small molecule strategy? And how is that reflected in the regulatory landscape? Uh, that's, that's again a great question. Because large molecules on the surface, they are much more difficult drugs to develop. They are large molecules. The large molecules are more difficult to manufacture than small molecules. Their bioavailability might be much more problematic. There's more molecules. Um, and so there are a lot of practical hurdles that drug developers need to overcome uh, for developing these antibody, antibody large, uh, antibody based uh, molecules, um, growth factors, and so on and so forth. Now, the big advantage goes down to selectivity. An antibody, for example, will bind to this epitope, to this specific epitope, in many, with many different uh, parts. So many different um, binding site specifically. And therefore, its specificity compared to a small molecule is exponentially higher. And you don't have to worry about non-specific events or you have to worry much less about no specific events to the point that uh, the major worry for most of antibody-based therapeutics these days are, for example, on target of tumor events. So they bind to a specific protein, but not on the site where it should be bound. Now, the, the flip side is that since they're so specific, more, more, more often than not, animal models do not express a target that is recognized by these drugs. Um, rodents share about 85% of genes among genomology with humans, and this is not enough. And therefore, rats and mice are very often like out of the game for the, developing, for the development of these therapeutic antibodies. Now, as I mentioned before, the FDA requires that in vivo experiment should be done in relevant species. And that's where non-human primates really come in very strongly because since they share such a high level of homology in the genomic sequence and in the protein sequence as a consequence, um, very often they are the only model the only non-genetically modified model that expresses a protein that is recognized by the antibody. So there's a yin and a yang, right? It's easier to develop, it's easier to manufacture, right? You don't, and not to manufacture, but we know how to manufacture it. So, uh, but on the other hand, it's more difficult to develop in vivo specifically. That's a really great summary of a very complex um, paradigm that we're in. Uh, just a reminder to any of you viewing live, you can go ahead and answer or ask your questions or put your commentary into the Q&A pod. Um, Adriano, I think you set up a really interesting paradigm here, kind of, as you said, the yin and the yang of historical small molecule context um, being kind of, you know, by nature of how they're designed, they were probably a little bit easier to, to develop, as you said, maybe previously uh, from a chemistry perspective. Um, and comparing that to antibodies now, which have more specificity or a little bit, a little bit more complex design, uh, design um, and now test from a, a toxicity standpoint. I think a lot of um, what you're saying is that there's been some advances in those technologies and our ability to develop those more specific molecules. Um, and it sounds like, you know, at least the regulatory agencies first started and really focusing a lot on those small molecules and, and the guidelines were kind of designed around those small molecules. Are we potentially at an inflection point where we need to start thinking about how the regulatory agencies um, adapt towards antibody-based therapeutics, or do you think we just, um, we just haven't gotten there yet? 
Uh, that's so regulatory agencies are notoriously slow at adapting to new landscapes, and rightly so, and rightly so, and uh, because their job is to avoid toxic molecules to get into the clinics and harm people, and therefore, if they have something that they have established that seems to work, obviously they will be very hesitant to move to something different. I think that the development of antibodies will force them to move in different direction. Uh, I was recently at a meeting where it was discussed the fact that maybe the entire CAR T field might be dying because the regulatory hurdles for development are so high that right now we are using in clinics like the first generation CAR T's and we're already at the fourth generation CAR T's in drug development, but it's so difficult to test these new reagents in humans because of all the issues. So clearly there, are, there, there is the need of new tools and there is the need of new tools that are widely accepted by the drug development community and therefore will be evaluated in the right way or in, 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 obviously in a, um, uh, in a very uh, structured way from these regulatory agencies. The tools that clearly are coming up, and I mean, when we talk about in vivo models for antibody drug development specifically, but for all large molecules or all very specific uh, test agents, essentially we are talking about an in vivo model that expresses in one way or another the human target. And the human target should be functional. It cannot just be a protein expressed somewhere in a mouse because it might not give you any information. And to my knowledge, the only real organism that is prone to humanization, because we can modify um, its genome to such extent, is the mouse. We can replace genes in the, mind, in the mouse and put in the human genes. So it's a genetic humanization. We can put human cells in the mouse, like human immune cells, and mimic what happens in the human immune system. Um, we can combine the two. We can humanize a target in a mouse and then put on top of those human immune cells and see how the drug modul modulates interaction between the target and the immune system. So there are a lot of tools that are getting developed right now. And uh, we start to see these tools used by major pharmaceutical companies, uh, such for example, Sanofi is using humanized FCRN mice regularly to, to test their PK of their antibody-based uh, compounds in the, in the pipeline compounds. Uh, Roche is using in an exceptional way um, immune system humanized mice to test efficacy and the safety of, of their treatments. So I think, I think that, that, that the community is embracing these tools and this will lead to a change in the regulatory landscape as well. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, was reading the US FDA's um, recommendations earlier this year um, that um, they are really actively trying to reduce the number of non-human primates that are used in toxicity testing. And one of their specific recommendations, which I'll read, is we, we strongly encourage the use of appropriate alternative models for access, uh, uh, assessing DART endpoints or developmental and reproductive toxicity endpoints, such as species specific surrogates in rodents, genetically modified rodents when scientifically justified. So it sounds like they're, we're coming from, you know, a, um, collectively, uh, scientifically, both from the the regulatory side as well as the model side that we are looking for more uh, scientifically relevant and more translationally relevant uh, species specific surrogate or rodents as uh, you had described about the humanization processes and that mice uh, lend themselves very well to both genetic and um, induced humanization. Thank you. So uh, we do have one question that came from the audience and it's kind of a provocative one. Um, and maybe this is a good way to kind of uh, wrap up our discussion. 
Um, so what do you think, uh, in terms of your final thoughts, uh, humanizing rodents and these, you know, alternative uh, species specific surrogates that we're, we're kind of talking about as a whole, are those humanized mice or humanized rodents ready to completely replace non-human primates in this process? So the, the, the short answer is no. Um, no, they're not ready. There are many reasons why they're not ready. Uh, and I, but I would say the main reason is because these are tools that are still in development. They're still characterized. We need the community to use them more widely and understand all of the nuances of this in drug development. But what they can do so far, I think, is to definitely reduce the number of non-human primates that might be used in research. So, for example, if you use humanized mice early enough in your discover pipeline, uh, in the drug discovery pipeline, and you remove the toxic liabilities before you get into monkeys, you might focus then all your resources only on the drug candidates that really have a good chance of not being toxic but being effective. So you will be using less monkeys because you will be doing less monkey experiments. You might refine the monkey experiments by running first this compound in mice and understand better what you're going to expect as an outcome from the non-human primate uh, experiment. And in some cases, these models might be even better than a monkey because, for example, if you're using a bispecific that recognizes a tumor-specific antigen, if the monkey doesn't carry a tumor, then, you know, the entire experiment is kind of meaningless, but you can onboard a tumor on these humanized mice. So depending on, 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 on how, I don't know what the future will, 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 serve, has, will serve for us, but I do have the impression that it's going to be more and more development of these tools, and this will help, if not replacing, definitely reducing the use of non-human primates in research. Great, that's fantastic. Um, a really interesting paradigm that you're describing about the replacement and, or maybe the refining, refining and reducing the use of non-human primates by looking for these alternatives in rodents. So thank you everybody. That's all the time we have for this week. Um, our next JAX Tech Talk is called Let's Talk Making Mouse Models with Large Transgenes, which incidentally is another humanization possibility there using CRISPR and things like that. And that will be live on Tuesday, June 28th. And uh, you can follow our JAX Tech Talk on LinkedIn so you're notified of any time we have a new episode or you can subscribe to our playlist on YouTube and catch all 54 other episodes of JAX Tech Talk. This is Janine and Adriano saying, stay healthy, stay safe and stay excited about research. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much.